International Court of Justice and Economic Session, Mr. President, Mr. Carl Koch, and the Honorable Judges Kina Galitani and Eka Keshalashvili presiding. The case before the court is a case concerning the Helian Hyacinth. The parties are applicant, the state of Odawa versus respondent, the Republic of Rasasa. The applicant and the respondent are each allocated 45 minutes to present their pleadings. without engaging the uh, state of the Tonya. Your Excellency, uh, since an uh, anti-monetary gold principle, the uh, legal interest must be the subject matter of the dispute, and only in such situation the court deciding the case will also affect the rights and obligations of another state. However, this is not the present case, because the question is only whether Adaba is a successor to the Treaty of Batega. But against that logic, you said that automatically the principle of automaticity will apply. Uh, and if this uh, court judges that, it will basically mean that Zaytun, Kingdom of Zaytonia is also, uh, has also succeeded to the Treaty of Batega. Must succeed to the Treaty of Batega under customary international law as well as Adaba. And uh, that is, the decision of this court will not impair the interests of the Tony, exactly. Only the question of Adaba. Okay, agent, is it your claim that this principle applies only to the territorial trades or there are <coughs> other circumstances in which the same principle could be applied? Your Excellency, our submission is that. Uh, yes, the uh, customer international law describes only that the state succeed automatically to territorial treaties. And your excellencies, the respondent in the Do you consider this a territorial treaty or a boundary treaty? 
it is specific that in the present case there is a territorial treaty, not boundary. Because yeah, this is for instance, before the PCHA in 1939, the uh, pardon me, 1932, the free zone case, the free zone case, in the free zone case, the question related to the neutralization of the national borders between France and Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And this situation is very similar to the present case because uh, in the present case also the states established the international zone of peace in Article 3 of the Treaty of the Canada among the national borders. And your excellency is there is agent, but the, the Treaty of Turin was about the fixing the boundary. Fixing the boundary, and then it came out the, 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 the dispute out of that. Here we do not have a boundary one, and second, actually, Adawa is not in any way attached to that part of territory which which we, which we are discussing. So how the uh, free zones case is actually applicable here? Your Excellency, uh, answering your first question, in that uh, in prison case, uh, the situation was not uh, absolutely as in the present case, but that question also related to neutralization of uh, those borders which were established. And because it was the question to promote amicable relations between states after Napoleonic Wars. And uh, answering your second question, the territory, the, the, the international zone of peace was established between the Junior and Rasasa. However, Rasasa, the Junior, and Adaba are all neighboring countries, and thus the international zone of peace is necessarily attached to the territory of Adaba. And what is more, according to Article Three Two of the Treaty of Batega, as other state parties, Adaba has a right to explore the possibility of expansion of this territory over of the other territories, including Adavan territory, your excellencies. And with regard to the present case, we only would like to provide you with the understanding that in the present case, there is a neutralized zone, the international zone of peace. And it is uh, uh, interpreting the treaty in the light of its object and purpose, and, uh, turning, uh, and drawing your attention to the preamble of the treaty. We would like to show you that this is a treaty of peace character, which established that the parties must always decide all their future disputes in peaceful way and uh, save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And so if we would find that the treaty is not of territorial character, is there any other claim that you would uh, bring up to our attention to support the claim that um, that was succeeded? Your Excellency, we have alternative argument and we kindly uh, refer you to our written memorials in which we submit also that there is a customary rule on automatic succession. But our substantive argument is that this is a territorial treaty. And moreover, the respondent relies on the fact that it is rather a political... What exactly is the customary rule of automatic succession? Does it apply to any cases of succession? Is there a sufficient practice or can you use on that? Your Excellency, briefly uh, answering this question, yes, there is customary on automatic succession due to the sufficient state practice and opinion use, particularly if we take into consideration practice of specially affected states, those who, who are successor state to the treaties and other state parties to those treaties who did not in any way protest such succession. And the International Law Commission concluded that there is sufficient state practice to formul formulate such customary rule. Can, can we claim that the fact that there are very few countries who have actually signed and, uh, and ratified the treaty uh, related to the succession to the treaties uh, is a fact that there is no state practice of opinion juries at large that would substantiate your arguments that there is a customer rule that already makes automation of succession. Your Excellency, may I clarify? The treaty uh, related to the succession of the states to the treaties has very few signatories to it. Isn't that the case? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, we are in the Convention on Succession, yes. Exactly. Yes. So could we consider it as a reflection of the fact that there is no widespread uh, <coughs> application of any state practice or opinion jurors even more so that there is an automation as a rule for the succession of the states to the treaty? No, Your Excellency, because the mere fact that there is such a treaty which uh, codifies, the, uh, the codifies such a rule, according to International Law Commission draft, uh, according to International Law Commission report on identification of customary rule, signifies that there is opinion juris of those states who are the parties of, uh, to this Vienna Convention on Succession, because in such a way they express their belief that there is and such rule. Do you claim that uh, the whole treaty is a codification of customary international law? 
No, Your Excellency, only Article 34 of the Vienna Convention in the, with regard to automatic succession. And turning to our previous argument with regard to territorial treaty, the respondent raised the question whether it is a political treaty rather than territorial and relies itself on, for instance, Israel Egypt Armistice Agreement. However, Your Excellency, after the security, after the Egypt blockade of Suez Canal uh, after the Egypt and Israel concluded this treaty. The Security Council mentioned that this treaty established not only armistice but also peace obligations. And this is blockade of Egypt violates the spirit of this treaty. And as a result, we even cannot rely on the fact that this treaty is an armistice agreement and compare it with our agreement, especially in the case where in the present case the parties strongly uh, express their desire to uh, dissolve all the disputes peacefully. So and speaking of uh, automation, don't you want to get on to your argument about the automated weapon? Uh, ab about automatic weapon? Yes. Yeah, it's a big part of your argument. You have many arguments to make. Of course, Your Excellency. Go ahead. Uh, Your Excellency, just to summarize our first submission, we uh, claim that since this is a peaceful treaty, this is a treaty which creates peaceful obligations and creates neutralized zone, which is. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, Your Excellency. Turning to our next submission, we have two main points. That firstly, Your Excellency, the Sasa violates international humanitarian law by development and deployment of the world. And secondly, alternatively, it violates international human rights law by development and deployment of the world. And turning to our first argument, we uh, address the principle of humanity in this regard. And the fact that by uh, deploy the deployment of the wall, Rasasa violates this principle. Generally, Has this the wall ever been fired? May I clarify, Your Excellency? Has anyone been killed at the wall? Not yet, Your Excellency. So but what is the violation? Your Excellency, still there is such a violation because according to opinion of Judge Chahabadan, a nuclear weapons advisory opinion, for instance, the, the weapon can be prohibited under the principle nuclear of human... Nuclear weapons are inherently indiscriminate <laughs> and the wall is supposed to be indiscriminate, so is it really uh, applicable? Your Excellency, we submit that the first uh, principle by uh, which the wall, which deployment of the wall violates is the principle of humanity, but alternatively we also claim that this is an indiscriminate weapon. But uh, turning to our substantiate position, still the uh, ad uh, autonomous weapons systems can be prohibited by the principle of humanity because that co this court has recognized this principle as customary international law and as effective mean of addressing unilateral technologies. And if the uh, a computer can defeat Gary Kasparov playing chess, so why can't the computer do a better job than having a human being on the wall? Your Excellency, we submit that computer cannot if it relates to the obligation to treat both combatants you and... you concede that a computer could defeat Gary Kasparov playing chess? Your Excellency, I can fight. Do you concede that a computer can defeat a human being playing chess? Uh, yes, Your Excellency. So human judgment is not necessarily better than machine judgment. Not in the question of killing of person, because the value of human life is much more important than playing chess. And your Excellency, uh, with regard to principle of humanity, the only being on the earth which can treat both civilians and combatants humanly is a human by itself, because this is the only being which can uh, understand human intentions, human which ha have human judgment, empathy, and mercy. And this is opinion. And human beings also panic. So this machine has a rules of engagement, which has a sequence of response. But the human being, with the same rules of engagement, can panic and then end up killing someone faster than this machine. So why is this machine worse than, uh, than uh, human judgment? It might be better than human judgment. Your Excellency, human can be held responsible for its panic, for its mistakes, for any violation of international internal law, but with regard to individual criminal responsibility, the world will never, will never be held responsible. And what is more, Your Excellency, according to paragraph 47 of the Statements of Fact, of the Statement of Assassin President, the world will use force against anyone who will cross the border illegally in case of ineffectiveness of its non-lethal measures. Mm -hmm.
questions. And one question is actually your scientists and your representatives were engaged in development of the wall for from the very beginning of this system, right? And at no stage you raised the question of violation of the principle of humanity or any other. You actually agreed and participate in the system. So um, how would you assess your drastic change of position right now? This is one question. And the second question, you actually raised the issue of the responsibility, right? So the, what is your core problem with the wall? Is it that the responsibility cannot be attributed? Or is it that, that really the, um, the, the principle of humanity or any other principle could be violated or is violated as a result of its use? Uh, your Excellency, answering your uh, first question with regard to development of the wall, the only principle of, uh, the general principle of law which can prevent Adava from claiming that there is, uh, that the wall is illegal is the uh, estopel. However, under this principle, the, one of the criterion is that the uh, Rasasa must suffer prejudice or Adava must secure benefit from its previous statement or acquiescence that the ball is legal. However, in the present case, Adava assigned all its rights from the project back to RRC, according to clarifications, Your Excellencies. And for that reason, it did not uh, secure any benefit from contribution to such development. And in any case, according to paragraph 23 of the Statements of Facts, it was Rasasan government who conducted the review on compliance with international law, not Adavan scientists. And your Excellency, answering your second question, our main argument is that uh, usage of the wall violates the principle of humanity. However, at the same time, it uh, also results in the question whether the person will be held responsible because the only human being, being which can have moral agency can, can be held responsible. This is the opinion. If a human being can't be held responsible, then why is it that uh, Darian Gray is in custody? Isn't she being held responsible? That's what you're trying to do. But your Excellency, Darian Gray will be. Question. What, if, if you're saying she cannot be held responsible, why is she in custody? Your Excellency, but a Davan government. Uh, just arrested her under the uh, under the warrant uh, arrest warrant of ICC in right, order to, to hold her responsible. Yes, to hold her responsible. Yes, yes. So uh, she developed the machine. She's being held responsible. I, I don't understand your position. You're saying a human being must be held responsible. It looks like a human being is being held responsible. That's what you're trying to do. What's the problem? The problem is that it, it is not Darren Gray who will decide whether the person will be killed or not while he will cross the border illegally, Your Excellency. It will be the wall and so the... then should she be let free? No, <laughs> if, she, if, she's not, if she's not involved in the chain of command, then why are you holding her? I, I don't understand your position. But Your Excellency, this is rather two absolutely different questions because Darren Gray must be held responsible for her war crimes committed in her private compa capacity being the uh, head of RRC and the question of autonomous weapon system is the question whether anyone will, uh, will be held responsible for war crimes and any criminal law violations. In excellence, due to the considerations of time, we would like to proceed to our alternative argument that Rasasa violates international human rights law by, development, by deployment of the world. Your Excellencies, in this regard, we claim that Rosasa will raise its obligation to protect the right to life under Article 6 of the ICC power. And particularly, each state part of the ICC power must minimize risk to life of people and avoid arbitrary killings during law enforcement operations. And in case of the uh, German Democratic Republic, although in that case it was only automatic fire system, which is not even comparable to autonomous weapon system, still the in European Court of Human Rights stated that the, the, the state cannot protect its border by any cost to excellences. Uh, Agent, why do you think that this will be arbitrary? It will amount to arbitrary killing. Uh, the system by itself has some um, the, the filters. Uh, so according to the statement of facts, they are not, it, the system doesn't shoot directly. So why in that case it would, it would amount to arbitrary killing? Your Excellency, according to Montero v. Venezuela case, the only situation in which usage of lethal force can be uh, not arbit arbitrarily, uh, can be lawful only if it meets the requirements of necessity and proportionality. Mm -hmm. And in the present case, the wall replaced a police agent, but your excellencies, it will not meet these requirements because 
still it can it cannot understand human intentions. It cannot, as police agent, use the measures of negotiation. Is that the case, agent, that there has been extensive uh, process of development in which extensively different case scenarios for war situations, often the law enforcement related situations, have been ingrained in the development of the system, and then empirical evidence showed so far that lethal force has never been used by the law. Yes, Your Excellency, it is true that it is, has uh, not yet used. However, according to our, our the Hungary case, for instance, right to, li right to life is applicable if there is a serious threat to a person, even if it, it, it has not materialized yet. And this is the present case. And what is more, the cases of... Just one question. If you are crossing the border, and if the border guard tells you to stop, and you continue crossing the border, they do it again, and you continue, would you think that then they might have a right to, rent, to, to use the firearm? And would it be necessary, I mean, would it comply with the principles of necessity and proportionality? Yes. Just because, yeah. First of all, according to Makan v. United Kingdom case and Makarashi v. Greece case, the police agent firstly must try to arrest the person and not to use force against him. But even if the police agent tries to stop the perpetration of serious crime, which involves great threat to life of another person, which tries to escape from arrest, for instance, or resist to arrest, yes, in such an occasion a police agent can use force, but it must not use lethal force intentionally to kill the person. But in case of ineffectiveness of no lethal measures uh, which the wall uh, uses, it in last resort still will use fifty caliber machine guns and in any case kill the person. And this is why it is incomparable this a police agent which will stop this person, which will arrest this person, which will talk with this person, understand his human right. intention. Counsel, isn't the fact that uh, this is for deterrence and nobody is crossing, so it's working. So uh, why, why should international law disrupt something that's working? I see my time is up, Your Excellency. May I? Well, that's a question. Why should international law disrupt something that's working? Your Excellency, it is true that international law must meet the requirement, the, the uh, development of techniques of warfare, and we do not uh, protest against that. However, the last life or death decision must be made by human. The state can rely on different algorithms, on artificial intelligence in order to understand where is uh, a military threat and where is a civil object, but the last decision must be made by human in order to save human life. Thank you for your attention and may I put the code. Mr. President, the Excellencies, may it please the Court. My name is Nella Kichigina and I appear on behalf of the applicant, the State of Adawa. I will address the applicant's last two submissions. The third concerns the inconsistency of Rosasa's imposition of Helen tariffs with its international obligations, and the fourth concerning the legality of Adawa's arrest and detention of Darian Gray. We have three main arguments with regard to our third submission. Firstly, that this court has jurisdiction over Adala's claim based on the CHC Treaty. Secondly, that this claim is admissible. And finally, that Rasasa violates its obligations under the CHC Treaty by imposing hell and tariffs. Back to our first point. The Excellency. Do you make no argument under the GATT? So, could it, could it, Do you make okay? any argument under the GATT or is it only under the CHC Treaty? The Excellency, the issue before this court is based on the uh, CHC Treaty. By contrast, before the World Trade Organization, Adava alleged the claim of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And this is the question of admissibility, which the agent would like to proceed um, as a second argument. Well, uh, I'm going to answer it now, because I'm interested in this question now. Uh, why shouldn't we just wait and let this case go to the WTO? Mr. President, this is for two main reasons, because in the present case there are two different issues before this court and the World Trade Organization and this patent's principle is not applicable and because the denial of jurisdiction in the present case would lead to the denial of justice. Why isn't it applicable? A, a, a case is pending, that's the pendants. Yes, Your Excellency. However, according to Upper Silesia case, 
the triple identity test or identity of the parties, the legal grounds, and the object should be met in order for list pendants to be applicable. And in the present case, by contrast, the criterion of the same legal grounds is not satisfied. And it is not the excellency, because according to, for example, Mox Plan case, even if two treaties contain similar obligations, they still exist separately because they have different object and purpose and because their application leads to different results. And for example, in CME, the Czech Republic, the arbitral tribunal declined to apply this pendants because the proceedings before another arbitral tribunal were based on a different bilateral investment treaty, although they granted comparable investment protection. Does it bother you that the WTO appellate body is not functioning? Yes, Your Excellency. It bothers you. <laughs> yes. Mr. President, and this is exactly why the situation of uh, the denial of justice would arise. Because currently, since the appellate body would not function properly, the respondent, if the outcome of the WTO panel proceedings would be unsatisfactory for their position, could just appeal and in this way stop the, the adoption of the report of the WTO panel and therefore the report will never become became binding. And this court should take it into consideration when declining to adjudge this case, Your Excellencies. And we submit that in the present case, back to the point of the list pendants and identical legal grounds, we submit that although it is true that both CHC Treaty and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade grant almost identical obligations with regard to tariffs, they still exist separately because they have different object and purpose. This is first, according to Article 1 of the CHC Treaty, this treaty was aimed at the primarily at the sustainable cultivation of Helen Hyacinth, which is a unique plant for Krasina region. And secondly, because by contrast, the GATT is aimed at the proliferation of trade among all WTO members. If we agree with you, I'm not sure, what is the remedy that you want? Should we simply call for a lifting of the tariffs? Should we call for consultations? Uh, are you asking for restitution in integrity? Mr. President, in this regard, Adela respectfully asked this court to award it with monetary compensation because according to paragraph 46 of facts, the financial losses suffered by Adavan farmers and according to ILC commentary with regard to articles on state responsibility, article 36, such type of financial loss can only be remedied by compensation and not by restitution, Your Excellency. And in this regard, we submit that WTO panel, by contrast, cannot award similar remedy to the applicant because the WTO compensation is non-monetary and voluntary payment. Are you aware of any case where the compensation was actually awarded under the WTO system? Yes, Your Excellency, and in that case, namely with regard to your copyright, U.S. Copyright Act, this compensation was awarded by the arbitral panel, not by the <coughs> WTO panel under which the proceedings are pending. And the Excellency says, this is, in any event, the extremely rare situation, and uh, in the case of the non-existent appellate body, this is... Do you still think that there is a possibility for the, double, for the compensation under the WTO system, or not? Yes, the Excellency, the parties would like to go to arbitration, however, this possibility is almost zero. And in this regard, Your Excellency, we claim that in any event, when deciding, and what is more importantly, when deciding whether assassin tariffs were legal or not, this court and the WTO will apply different legal rules. This is because the security exception clause on which respondent relies is drafted differently in the general agreement on tariffs and trade and in the CT treaty. And therefore, no conflicting decisions will arise because the court will apply different legal tests. And moreover, Your Excellencies, back to the point of denial of justice, we submit that according to Chorzo Factory, the court cannot decline to exercise its jurisdiction if it would lead to the possibility of creating the denial of justice for the applicant. And in the present case, we rely on the fact that no, neither the appellate body is functioning, not, nor the compensation is practically possible to uh, Your Excellency submit that this court should arrive at the conclusion that it cannot decline to exercise its jurisdiction. And moreover, in Mexican soft drinks, for example, the WTO stated that it cannot decline to exercise its validly established jurisdiction because it would deprive the injured state of the possibility of seeking redress. 
Agent, if we, um, if this court finds that the, uh, the compensation is still possible under the WTO system, or if both states would agree on the, on the particular action under the WTO system, do you think that in this case uh, the jurisdiction of, of this court would be affected in discussing this case? Yes, Excellency, no, for one main reason, because the jurisdiction of the court only depends on the consent of the parties. And therefore, it cannot be affected by the fact whether the WTO can grant compensation or not. And in the present case, Your Excellencies, both Adava and Rasasa agreed to the compulsory jurisdiction of this court in the Treaty of Batega, Article 6. And meanwhile, there is no such agreement to the WTO jurisdiction over the CHC Treaty. And by contrast, the states, when they want to provide such and jurisdiction... Nevertheless, you're citing WTO precedent to us. Why shouldn't we just ignore it? Mr. President, because according to Article 38.1d, we can rely on judicial decisions and uh, the excellencies in this regard, this court um, can substantiate the findings of the Good. So what is the, what is the relationship between uh, this case and uh, Ukraine, Russia, Russia uh, traffic and transit case? Mr. President, indeed, the following relies on, relies on Russian uh, traffic and transit case. And, Your Excellencies, in this, in this regard, we submit that the only reason the respondent would like to proceed with the WTO proceedings is because it allows the state a wider discretion with regard to adoption of necessary measures to protect their security interest. And this is evident from the written memorials of the respondent where they explicitly provide that the WTO panel uh, the WTO panel requires less stringent uh, requirements in order to proceed with the security exception clause. And in this case, Your Excellencies, it is particularly important not to apply the Russian, the Russian traffic and transit case because in that instance, the tribunal, the WTO panel, analyzed another provision which is drafted differently and allows the discretion to the state, namely because it allows the adoption of such measures that states considers necessary. And by contrast, the Article 22 of the CETA Treaty only allows for such measures which are necessary to protect essential security interests. And the Excellency is concluding my argument we submit that this court cannot decline it to exercise jurisdiction because the Dallas claim is admissible. I'm proceeding with my third argument with regard to the legality of Rasasa's imposition of hell and tariffs. We submit that Rasasa cannot justify its imposition of hell and tariffs by relying on the security exception clause. It cannot because the state is not free to elevate any concern to that, to that of an essential security interest. And for instance, in CMS v. Argentina, the tribunal stated that only the situation of the possibility of a total economic collapse could be recognized as a threat to essential security interests. And if we compare the situation in Argentina, where, for example, in LG Energy, the tribunal indeed recognized such a threat, we can see that in the Argentina, by contrast to Rasasa, there was not only economic crisis or problems, but also Isn't the that that's too high? Total economic collapse. Uh, don't essential security interests get implicated before the country is in a state of total economic collapse? Mr. President, in that, indeed we speak only of the possibility of a total economic collapse. The country should not wait before its economy collapses. However, it is important to understand that the state cannot invoke the security exception clause to circumvent its obligations only because one industry in its economy suffers or suffers the decline. Because, Your Excellencies, it would simply, uh, it would simply make all obligations of states not efficient because in the present case, Rasasa in, imposed tariffs in order to safeguard its own domestic industry, disregarding the CHC common aims of sustainable cultivation. According to paragraph 43, Your Excellencies, of, and the statement of the CHC Director General, Rasasa, by its unilateral imposition of tariffs, violates the very, the very purpose of the CHC community for which it was Rasasa established. Rasasa withdrew the tariffs. Could you withdraw your objection to the wall? Mr. President, could you clarify a question? If Rasasa uh, withdrew the tariffs, would Adawa withdraw its objection to the wall? After all, the wall has never been fired. Then we could go home. No, Mr. President, because 
the, uh, each breach of international obligation entails a, a obligation for the respondent to make a reparation. And in this regard, unless this court uh, finds, if this court finds that Rasasa violates its international obligations, Adawa, Adawa needs to receive compensation as a remedy for such violation. And moreover, Your Excellencies, we submit that there is that respondent cannot rely on the security exception clause because the threat to essential security interest does not exist. This is because, according to paragraph 9 of the Statement of Facts, it is clearly stated that Rosasa is a significant participant in the international technology sector and has a robotics industry. And therefore, Your Excellencies, its economy is diversified and does not depend on the sole exploitation of the Helen Hyacinth. And therefore, the mere decline in the Helen sector of Rasasa six years after the hurricane mechanism struck the region cannot lead to the possibility of a total economic collapse. And moreover, Your Excellencies, we submit that Rasasa cannot rely on its own trade interest in order to break the multilateral trading system that it has agreed to promote by establishing the cuisine and Helen community. And for that reason, Agent, is there anything uh, to substantiate your argument, any legal principle that just because the country has a diversified economy, they cannot base their argument on one particular, the, 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 um, one particular sector, influence of a particular sector, um, rather than it should be, um, let's, let's put it that way, the, um, uh, it should, the, the essential interest should affect the whole economy rather than one or two sectors. Your Excellency, there is no, satis there is no settled uh, test, however, we rely on the arbitral tribunal decisions with regard to security exception and Argentina situation. And comparing the situation in Rosasa to Argentina, we submit that there was indeed not only the economic crisis, but also the political and social instabilities with almost half of the population living below poverty. And this is because, uh, and this is why the tribunal, for example, in LG Energy indeed recognized a threat to Argentina's essential security interest. By contrast, Your Excellencies, we submit that the threshold which, which was established by the ju judicial decisions and arbitral decisions is very high, and Rosasa cannot reach this threshold in the present case, Your Excellencies. So, Council, now that we're at this stage of the argument, isn't it clear that your effort to arrest the foreign minister is a little bit overkill? First, you take, want to take down a wall which has never been used. Now you're pounding them on their tariffs before a tribunal that's not the WTO, and that's not enough for a DAWA. You have to arrest this poor lady who is just a nice uh, computer expert. Uh, shouldn't we just say stop at this point, it's just in the interest of justice? Mr. President, proceeding with our first submission, we submit that Darren Gray is not a nice person, <laughs> but because it has, it has indeed a notorious reputation, because 20 years ago, Human Rights Watch accused her of active complicity in keeping the war. What crime is she guilty? Your Excellency, it com allegedly committed war crimes because it, she was charged with committing war crimes by the International Criminal Court. And we submit that Adawa, as a state party to well, the a lot of people have been charged by the International Criminal Court and then acquitted, like Lubanga. Um, so she's been charged, though. What? We should conclude she's a war criminal, which she decided, designed a wall that's never been used. Mr. President, we need to provide you with an understanding that Darren Gray is charged for committing war crimes in another state, not in the state of Adawa and with regard to the wall, however, in the state of Garantia, which is a state body to the Rome Statute, and in which there was certain violations of Geneva Conventions and other violations of laws and customs applicable to non-international. You can see this is not controlled by the arrest warrant case, Belgian. Your Excellency, we need to provide Firstly, back to my... Do you concede that it is not controlled by that case? The facts are not the same. Mr. President, yes. And we need to differentiate arrest warrant case from our case because in that case, according to paragraph 54, there was stated that high officials enjoy immunities from foreign criminal jurisdiction. And by contrast, in this case, we submit that according to the paragraph 61 of that case, the court clearly stated that foreign officials, incumbent foreign officials, may be prosecuted by the international tri criminal tribunals, including the International Criminal Court. And this is the difference because the sovereign equality of states, which is the rationale of the principle of immunity before another, court another state jurisdiction, is not applicable in the present case. 
and Your Excellencies, there is. And what does the ICC, International Statute of International Court of Just, uh, International Criminal Court, say about the non-state parties and the obligations of non-state parties before that? Madam President, the Rome Statute. Uh, we submit that the Rome Statute in Article 98, on which the respondent relied in their written memorial, mm -hmm. is only addressed to the International Criminal Court and does not protect the immunities of non-officials. This is because the obligation in question is limited to the uh, inability of the ICC to issue an arrest warrant if it finds some procedural obstacles. And if the International Criminal Court, as in the present case, issued an arrest warrant for Darren Gray, it means that it found no procedural immunity to stop them from doing this. And do you and think that this court is actually a um, um, right place to interpret the uh, uh, wrong statute, or should we, for instance, give this opportunity, including our interpretation of Article 98 to the ICC itself? Madam President, the question leads me to our main argument with regard to existence of customer international law, absence of immunity, rule on the absence of immunity before international criminal court. And this means... Who did first answer my question? Madam President, Your Excellency, to clarify, Although Rasasa is not a part of the Rome Statute, we submit that there is a customer international law which should be appropriately determined by this court and applied by this court. And it is especially important since the International Criminal Court will decide the issue of individual criminal responsibility, while this honorable court will address another question, the question of the, the existence of customer international law immunities and the existence of the obligation to other states. With regard so if we to make that ruling, does the ICC have to respect it? What if they mm -hmm. find the other way? Mr. President, indeed, the International, Crimi the International Criminal Court uh, must respect and indeed rely on the arrest warrant case, for example, in their decisions. And uh, in, th in this regard, we submit that the International Court of Justice is an authoritative body which can create not the precedent legally, however, the opinion which would be indeed followed by other tribunals as a principal organ of the United Nations. Was Minister Gray just leaving the country after a diplomatic conference? Why, why wasn't she just conducting her diplomatic function? And why didn't they persona non grata her rather than arrest her? Mr. President, this is because Adawa was obliged under Article 59 of the Rome Statute to arrest and surrender Darren Gray to the International Criminal Court. And proceeding to our argument with regard to the absence of your immunities, we would like to provide you with sufficient state practice and opinion juris to prove that she enjoyed no immunity when Adamant authorities arrested her. This is because the absence well, Bashir went around to all kinds of places and didn't get arrested. He's a head of state. Mr. President, and this is exactly why the Adala should arrest Darren Gray, because otherwise, as, as well as all African states and Jordan, who found non-compliant with their international obligations by the International Criminal Court, Adala would be found in non-compliance with its obligations under the Rome Statute, would it fail to proceed with surrender. And in this regard, it is especially important for this court to decide, on the to decide in the uh, in the interest of justice, Your Excellencies, that Adala may surrender Darren Gray to the International Criminal Court because as evident from paragraph 53 of Statement of Facts, Rosasa has no intention neither to try nor to prosecute Darian Gray before its own courts or to surrender it or to surrender her to another tribunal. And this is because the and, and this is why, Your Excellencies, the only way to end impunity and indeed commit the purpose of the International Criminal Court for which it was established is to surrender Darren Gray to the International Criminal Court. And back to my point with regard to state practice, Your Excellencies, we submit that already in 1946, the Nuremberg Tribunal stated that the perpetrators of war crimes cannot be protected by their official capacity to escape from the responsibility in appropriate proceedings. Again, let me take you back to the al-Bashir case. Um, do you think that it could be any relevance that unlike in al-Bashir case or in Gaddafi case, here we do not have um, any security council resolution? Madam and Pre how it will affect the interpretation of Article 98, among others? Your yeah, Excellency, indeed, the Security Council resolution took place in the Al-Bashir case. However, according to Al-Bashir Jordan's appeal of the International Criminal Court, this is not the Security Council resolution which waived immunity of Al-Bashir, but rather the customer international law. 
under which the immunities does not apply before the International Criminal Court. And we would like to rely on our written memorials to substantiate our position with regard to opinion juris of your excellencies with regard to absence of immunity before International Criminal Court. Why shouldn't we just find that uh, Dorian Gray um, was a technological innovator like Bill Gates? Uh, a after all, uh, Bill Gates' uh, computer program was used as the basis for the Nopetya virus, which, as you know, had a devastating effect in Ukraine. So does that mean that anyone who develops a computer uh, program that can be used to cause damage suddenly becomes a war criminal under your analysis? Doesn't that spread international criminal law too far? Mr. President, I see my time is up. May I answer a question? I'm interested to know whether we can prosecute Bill Gates. Mr. President, Bill Gates is completely different person and with regard to Darren Gray, we submit that the person who was alleged of committing the most heinous crimes which are of concern of the international community as a whole cannot be protected by immunity and cannot be protected just because she come up with some technological innovation. And in this regard, Your Excellencies, we submit that the, this court, as the International Court of Justice, must proceed to surrender Darren Gray to the International Criminal Court. And, Your Excellencies, this concludes the arguments of the applicant. Thank you for your attention. If we rule for you on the uh, wall, and if we rule for you on the tariff, do you care about Dorian Gray? Can we just let her go? Just say, let her go. Uh, no, Mr. President, because... You won't give up on any part. Because the victims in Garantia and other and other states which suffered from Darren Gray's alleged war crimes cannot be remedied just because the wall would not be, uh, will be dismantled, Your Excellencies. And therefore, in the interest of justice and ending impunity, we respectfully ask this court to declare that Adama may proceed to surrender Darren Gray to the International Criminal Court. Thank you for your attention and Thank may please the court. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, learned colleagues, may it please this honorable court. My name is Tatiana Avdeyeva, and I, along with my co-agent, Mr. Maxim Vistik, and Ms. Lydia Volkova, citizen of Council, have the great honor to appear before you today as agents for Rosaza, the respondent in the present dispute. For the following 21 minutes, I will be addressing the submissions pertaining to the absence of the jurisdiction of this honorable court under the Bottega Treaty, as well as lawful development and diplomat of the war. While my question taking 22 minutes, will elaborate on the legality of tariffs on Hellen products and illegitimate apprehension and detention of his grave. We also respectfully allocate two minutes for the sorry body. For the convenience of the Honorable Court, respondent will address the issues following the order perceived by the applicant side. In this respect, proceeding with the first submission, if absences, the applicant raised two main arguments, namely, first of all, that Bottega Treaty can be allegedly considered as establishing the territorial regime and therefore it can be subjected to automatic succession, and secondly, that automatic succession rule is applicable to the present dispute, and respondent will address them in turn. With regard to the territorial character of the Bottega Treaty, customary law indeed provides that rights and obligations which are linked to territorial regimes survive state succession. However, political treaties do not, because they are strictly linked to the identity of the extinguished state. And in this regard, respondent submits that the Treaty of Bottega shall be considered as a political one, because territorial regimes which are established by the treaties shall create a permanent... Is that a meaningful difference? Mm -hmm. me? All treaties have political aspects, whether they include boundaries or territory or not. So you're saying draw a distinction between political treaties and boundary and territorial treaties, can't we just say that there is no meaningful distinction? Mr. President, in this case, we submit that this treaty is of purely political nature without <coughs> any territorial provision, and therefore the automatic succession... A zone of peace is not territory? Yes, Your Excellency, because peace covered the whole territory of the state. Zone. The zone is territory, right? Your Excellency, it might be considered... Is the zone territory? Yes, Your Excellency. In this respect, however, it is important that the status upon the territory 
is linked to the territory of the specific successor state. In the present case, however, according to Article 3 of the Botaga Treaty itself, even the possibility of expansion of this zone, and I quote, is limited uh, to, uh, the, uh, to other areas on or in close proximity to the border between Lithuania and Rasazo. Consequently, no mention of the applicant state is present even with relation to the uh, expansion of this international zone of peace. Moreover, your excellencies, are so, so you say that because it's not attached to the applicant state, it is not, they cannot, it is, it is not the territorial treaty in terms of, for, for, for the, for, for the applicants. Yes, Your Excellency, we submit that applicants directly cannot succeed to the treaty for the In the state practice, are you aware of any example where, um, let's assume that this is a territorial treaty, um, uh, the territorial treaties were not attached to the territories of, uh, of states? Your Excellency, uh, to the best knowledge of respondent, there are no examples when the territory was not attached because the state of the separate part of the territory uh, seceded from, from the uh, main part of it. However, in Ireland Islands, for instance, when Finland uh, separated from Russia in 1917, there was a case that the demilitarized zone was still established on the territory of Finland, and therefore the International Court stated that it uh, can be subjected to the state succession simply because it is linked to the territory of successor state. In the present dispute, however, the situation is different because the international zone of peace is no way, in no way linked to the applicant's territory. Moreover, armistice demarcation lines under Article 1 of the Botaga Treaty are of temporary nature and were established, and I quote, without prejudice to the ultimate settlement of the dispute. Is Lithuania bound by the Treaty of Botaga? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, Rasmus, Rasmus is bound by the Treaty of Botaga. No, Zetunia. Oh. Yes, Rasmus, it's in the International Zone of Peace directly covers the Zetunian region of the Adawa Zetunian <laughs> Union, consequently succession occurs. So of the three uh, countries, Adawa, Rasasa, and Zetunia, who is bound by the Treaty of Botaga now? Your Excellency, even if this court finds that particular territorial peculiarities might be established by Article... I'm just asking for the question, which of the three is bound? Your Excellency, respondents say that only Rosas and Zetunia are bound by the Montana Treaty as of now. However, even if this court considers that territorial regimes related to the applicant state might be found in the Botaga Treaty, Rasasa submits that only rights and obligations, which are linked to the territorial regime itself, survive state succession. In this respect, applicant has referred you to the Gabchikova case, where this court found that in case the treaty does not terminate, it devolves upon the successor state automatically. However, the peculiarity of Gabchikova and Nadimara's case was that the all uh, clauses in the 1977 treaty were linked to the operation of the territorial regime, either from economic or from the uh, technical perspective. In the present case, Article 6 of the Botaga Treaty in no way relates to the operation of Article 1 of Article 3. However, it refers to all the disputes. Excuse me, I'm so confused. What, what kind of succession are we talking about? Uh, what, what happened in this case in your um, legal assessment? Is it a separation? or it's the dissolution of the state that was previously in union. Your Excellency, respondent submits that it can be considered as dissolution. However, customary norm regarding the automatic succession of territorial treaties applies irrespective of the way of how the states dis uh, actually dissolved, either peacefully or they emerged from the former colonies. Are there any examples that you could cite with the state practice uh, when dissolution has happened and then based on the object and purpose of the treaty, especially if it concerns the peaceful coexistence of the previously United States, would bear implication to the case under our consideration today? Uh, Your Excellency, please can I clarify? Uh, it shall be related to the territorial regime itself or simply the example of the dissolution? Not only territorial regime, general dissolution. For instance, after the, after the dissolution of the USSR, the uh, successors to the USSR must, in order to uh, comprise the declaration stating that they succeed to the old treaties of the, uh, their predecessor, in such a way expressing their consent to be bound by the treaties. Is it a dissolution case or something else perhaps what happened with the USSR on the terms? Um, Your Excellency, from the perspective of law and state succession, it shall be considered as dissolution. How comes that Russia is seen to be a successor of this USSR? 
not exactly your absence. With regard to the property of the USSR and uh, also uh, the uh, the um, monetary issues, Russia indeed was a, success, a successor to the USSR. However, with respect to the treaties themselves, according to the declaration which was concluded by the uh, states uh, after the dissolution of, of their predecessor, uh, all the treaties were bound for all successors equally. Consequently, we submit that in the turning back to the submissions of the uh, alleged territorial nature of the treaty, respondent submits that only rights and obligations which were linked to the territorial regime can survive this succession. However, articles in, in, in line of this, actually, I want to go back to the question that Mr. President um, 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 posed and refer you to Article 3, Paragraph 1, a third line, which of, 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 of Treaty of Vatican which says that um, the, the zone shall be accessible to all citizens, which actually means that the citizens of, at this stage, the applicants are all will also have an access to the zone and use the rights uh, given by this, by, by this treaty to that, right? So against this logic, when you say that the, it could be, uh, if, if it is territorial treaty, it applies to the Tony only. But in practice, you also, Recognize that Adawa citizens could be could use the treaty, could use this right in this in this um, in this article in this paragraph. In absence, indeed, if this court recognizes the international zone of peace as expanding even even towards Adavian citizens, still they can exercise the rights only under the Article Three, however, not under the Article Six of the Bottega Treaty. Therefore, this honorable court still will not have the jurisdiction over the applicants' claims. And in respect of the alleged automatic succession rule which was presented by the applicant side, we submit that state practice and opinion juris are lacking in the present dispute. First of all, Your Excellencies, with regard to the state practice, the whole scope of such practice which were presented by Adawa in their written submissions on the pages 25 and 26 relate not to the automatic succession rule, however to the continuity of treaties following the state's consent. For instance, in Iceland Denmark uh, dissolution case of 1944, according to the Secretariat study of extradition treaties, at least was published by the Icelandic Foreign Ministry, and therefore they showed their desire to be bound by the old treaties of their predecessor state. And it is important to mention that they also requested the consent of all the counterparties to those treaties to be present in order to be bound by those agreements. The same happened in the dissolution of Grand Columbia of 1831, when the states uh, showed their desire to be bound by the treaties explicitly, while the United Kingdom directly stated that only upon its consent that the, the succession to the treaties with the predecessor state can happen. Similarly, Your Excellency, after Czechoslovakia dissolution in 1993, similar situation happened because Hungary and Slovakia publish the relevant treaties on their official websites. And in such ways they demonstrated by their opponents that they perceive those agreements as being binding. So if we, we look into the state practice of, of three states or two states here, in practice you actually acknowledge that this zone still exists and, and the citizens have, uh, you know, are using it. So doesn't, couldn't this be equated to the recognition, to the acceptance of treaties, but, but from, from the practice. Yes, yes, let me clarify. Uh, the argument regarding automatic succession pertains to the separate norm of international uh, law and state succession, which regulates the succession to treaties irrespective of whether territorial regime is present or not. Yes, but, but, but let's assume that we have one treaty, and none of the states had any written, uh, um, written communication about the succession. But they, in practice, use this treaty. Does this mean that they, they is there still a need for notification or publishment, uh, publishing? Or from the state practice, could be assumed that if both states tacitly and actively use the treaty, it means that it is bound. They are, both of them are bound. In our sense, indeed, tacit performance of obligations under the treaty might suffice. However, unfortunately, the statement of agreed facts is silent upon the fact of whether this zone was actually used by the citizens of Adawa. And moreover, in this regard, uh, it, is, it would amount to violation of sovereignty of the Tunia and Rosaza if the citizens of Adawa would 
cross the border and exercise their rights in the international zone of peace without the consent of those states, because such an express consent is required in cases of conclusion of bilateral treaties. Namely, bilateral agreements has, have essentially voluntary character and can devolve upon the successor state only following the consent but of... But setting the aside uh, the old cases and focusing on uh, sort of more modern cases like Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, when it's a dissolution, shouldn't international law favor continuity? Um, Mr. President... Otherwise, the, the successor nations are unbound by international law and then they, they can do whatever they want, like set up a wall or impose tariffs. Um, that's, that's the kind of problem that we face, right? Mr. President, in respect of bilateral treaties, respect for the no, because they depend upon the belief of the uh, both states which conclude such a treaty in the good faith of the counterparty. And especially when it relates to the clauses which refer all the disputes between the parties to a particular judicial body, it is essential that the states cannot obtain such a consent to refer the disputes simply from the treaty which was concluded by the predecessor state. Because after dissolution, the economic and political peculiarities of functioning of the, of the state can differ significantly. However, Your Excellency, even if this court considers that Article 6 might be binding upon the parties, and therefore you have powers to hear the claim uh, of the applicant, Rosalza still submits that no violation of international obligations took place on its behalf, namely both development and deployment of the wall complied with international law. Thus, in this respect, proceeding with the second submission, respondent will demonstrate. Is this machine perfect? Uh, Your Excellency, uh, respondent submits that although the possibility of mistake exists, it is complied with international standards. Uh, everybody up here watched the Terminator. These always malfunction. <laughs> so you know, why should we? Why should we assume that this machine is perfectly programmed? Mr. President, respondent assumes that Terminator might be improperly programmed. However, in the present case, the reviews showed that the wall was indeed programmed properly because there were hundreds of thousands of computer simulations and field tests in more than 30 states. Is and it better than human judgment? Yes, Your Excellency. And so why are you having a case heard before three human beings? Why not get uh, artificial intelligence up here to decide your case? Wouldn't they do a better job? <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, that's an interesting question. And the, uh, <laughs> yeah, what's your and answer? If you love machines so much, why don't you get rid of us? And we could all sleep later today. Since so this case is a precedent in the sphere of the uh, ruling upon the automatic uh, machines, respondents submit that no indicators was That's the whole point. That's the whole point. If this is a precedent, we're headed down the road to where uh, all human judgments are being replaced by machines for all kinds of things, and uh, that makes us very worried. So what, why, why should we not be worried? Uh, Mr. President, in this respect, we refer you to the paragraph uh, 20 of the facts, and there it is directly stated that the world is able to reasonably differentiate the change in circumstances as well as react upon the change in surrounding. Namely, it can even identify the retreat, incapacity, and surrender. Namely, it is able to stop the attack when it is completely necessary. Moreover, the wall is not subject to emotional component. For instance, special reporter Heinz in his report... What is the lex specialis here? Are we in a non-international armed conflict, or are, is it human rights law? Is it the law of weapons? What, what law is uh, controlling law here? Mr. President, neither in uh, the written submissions nor in oral pleadings, respondent raises the argument regarding the knife. However, we submit that the customary international law codified in Article 36 of the Additional Protocol 1 applies to certain instances such as development of new weaponry even in peaceful times, and that is directly the present dispute. And it was also upheld by this honorable court in nuclear weapons advisory opinion that in case the new weapon emerges, international humanitarian law and in particular standards of humanity and discipline. But is there a use not bellum violation is a threat of force on, in violation of Article 2.4? Isn't a threat of force? Uh, respect to the Mr. President, respondent denies any allegation of threat of force or use of force for the purposes of the absence of coercive intent which might be directed against political independence or territory. Isn't that a pretty bold statement? They're basically saying if you walk into this zone you'll get killed. That sounds like a threat of force to me. 
not exactly, Mr. President, because it is directly stated that individuals are prohibited from conducting illegal actions which are directed at the national security of Rosaza, and it is the reasonable state of things on the international arena. Moreover, the wall primarily deploys non-lethal force, namely there are verbal warnings and warning shots, as well as incapacitation. And in view of the fact that one can reasonably differentiate the change in circumstances, even if individual comes into the close proximity to the border and stops there, the world will never shot him, and if the verbal warnings might be stopped or proceeded. Council, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees are trying to cross into Greece and Turkey, uh, and some of them look like gangs. Uh, did they just set up guns and kill them? Is that, is that your submission? Well, why doesn't this lead to um, massive uh, over deterrence through the use of automated weapons? Even if you consider that such situation might be illegal, respondents admit that the wrongfulness of its activities can be precluded by the state of necessity. And in this respect, bearing the burden of proof, Rasada shall demonstrate that six cumulative criteria are satisfied. However, in the interest of time, we will demonstrate that the most disputable of them are not, namely the presence of the grave and imminent peril and the absence of any alternative means toward the deployment of the war. Adrian, I have one clarifying question, actually, a question I'm worried uh, a bit. It's in paragraph Q, uh, paragraph, paragraph 20, um, which says that the, actually the training data through which the algorithm of the wall was developed um, included the um, uh, data acquired both from police and both from the military forces. Now, the question is here, when a person enters into the zone where the wall is deployed, can the wall be able to differentiate which, pub, which body of law, which situation here, which, which data should be used? whether it is a military, whether it is a police. Because this is something that is very important in order to differentiate, in order to say whether this system is, um, is legal or not. Yes, Your Excellency, because the world was not only filled with the data pertaining to the criminal activities in peaceful times and armed conflicts, it also was such a data was tagged by the software engineers as indicators, and therefore, based on those indicators, the world is able to assess the circumstances and therefore act properly. Consequently, respondents admit that in this respect, the world complies with the principle of distinction and humanity. When you say that there's no alternative means, uh, shouldn't it have an alternative means to the use of lethal force? Isn't that a, a very dangerous uh, outcome to be authorized by this law? Mr. President, in the present circumstances, unfortunately, it was impossible because the threat which was caused were the armed militia which were attacking the civilian population and assaulting and even killing villagers. Moreover, they also simultaneously attacked nine police stations. Therefore, merely incapacitation... They couldn't be, they couldn't be arrested or put in prison. In this respect, Your Excellency, we submit that in the present circumstances, the possibility... You couldn't use rubber bullets. Pardon me? Rubber bullets. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, pardon me, I see that my time is up. May I answer your question? Please. Uh, with regard to the rubber bullets, they would be ineffective against highly organized and well-armed militia, which were willing to uh, conduct drug trafficking from the territory of respondent. Consequently, the resources submit that this authority, although being possible, would be completely ineffective towards the police threat. One question from my um, I just want to refer you to, to what the uh, applicant said. Um, one of his arguments was that the final decision must be made by humans, right? This was the exact wording, if I'm not mistaken, by the applicants. So how would you respond to that? Yes. The, the, the decision to shoot, I guess, this is what they meant. In this respect, special reporter Heinz directly stated, that the autonomous machine is unable to, as, uh, to react as, as expedi uh, pardon me, humans are unable to react as expeditiously as autonomous machines. And therefore, in case there would be a big a number of people who are simultaneously across the board have been well armed, humans might possibly be subject to panic, fear, or anger, and therefore make mistakes, while the machine will not. But I think that my fellow judge is asking who makes the mm -hmm. final decision to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, the world itself. 
the machine. Trust the machine. That's your position. We should trust the machine. Yes, Your Excellency. However, upon the indicators which were previously filled by human beings and were filtered from improper decisions. Did, didn't Darian Gray make the command decision? Uh, Your Excellency, in this respect, we submit that she was the head of the RRC. However, the software engineers filled the system itself. Therefore, she cannot be considered as a commander of the machine. Ah, so the software engineers are just following orders and the people at the top have no command responsibility. Is that your position? Mr. President, in this regard, uh, in the special report of Mr. Hans, it was directly stated that there are three alternatives towards accountability, and it might be the commander, the liability for civil damages which was uh, imposed upon the developers, or liability in advance. And in the present case, also in the interstate relations, the liability can be posed on the state itself which deploys the weapon. Consequently, it is of improper functioning that would be liability on our society. Thank, Thank you, you and make this a Good morning, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, and the opposing councils. May it please the My name is Maxim Bishop, and for the last 22 minutes, I am the honor to present the third and fourth submissions of respondent concerning the legitimate imposition of Helen Terrius and the unlawful arrest and detention of Ms. Darren Gray by the state of Adama. Like my co-agent for the cause better assistance, I will address the issues following the structure of the applicant's sort of evidence. Thus, Your Excellencies, within the scope of this submission, we will present the following arguments. Firstly, the court lacks jurisdiction over Adama's trade claim due to WTO's special competence to deal with it. Secondly, and to So let's get that one out of the way. Uh, they're not functioning, are they? WTO. Yes, Your Excellency. Uh, uh, may I clarify the question? But, uh, the question is about the appellate body. Yeah, so uh, why should we send the case to a non-functioning uh, court? Mr. President, we respectfully disagree with this statement because WTO system is functioning nowadays apart from the possibility of appellate review. But still, our answer... That's like saying my car is functioning, aside from the fact that two of the wheels don't work. Your Excellency, but the WTO system is different, because comparable to the car example, it will be likely if, for example, the uh, window does not work uh, properly, but still the window is closed, but the car works properly and may be driven. The same happens with the appellate body and the panel review, because uh, the, the possibility of appeal nowadays does not exist. But firstly, the members of WTO work on the alternative means, and secondly, uh, according to dispute settlement understanding of WTO, decision of the panel will be then binding upon the parties. But if the panel is wrong and the, and the appellate body would find that it made a mistake of law, it can't make that ruling. And so the, the mistaken legal ruling becomes final. So isn't that allowing a broken car to continue? Mr. President, but still there are nowadays international bodies where the possibility of appeal does not exist. And the example of this is for uh, this honorable court, but still the decisions are final and binding. We don't have an appellate system built in. They do. Their system is an appellate system that happens to be non-functioning. Mr. President, then our alternative to this point would be that if the applicant uh, feared the denial of justice in the WTO system, then it may suspend the parallel proceedings in WTO and solely bring the dispute before this honorable court. But still, what we, what we contend is uh, abusive and excessive in this particular case is parallel proceedings pursued before two tribunals concerning the same subject matter. Adrian, you say that the special competence of WTO uh, strips uh, the ICJ of jurisdiction. Is, so, is this the, the, the any way prescribed under the WTO or under the, this, uh, this statute? Uh, no, 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 Your Excellency. We rely on this point on the President of the Court in Northern Cameron's case, where the Court went onto the, onto the questions of jurisdiction proprio motu and stated that if adjudication of the claim will be inconsistent with the core judicial function or judicial integrity in general, the Court may decline jurisdiction. So is it that we may decline uh, or versus that this Court doesn't have a jurisdiction? Is it a question of jurisdiction or is it maybe we have a jurisdiction, but then anyways we have to... Uh, take this into consideration, this principle, and maybe not admit or not uh, decline, decline to hear the issue. Your Excellency, we submit that uh, jurisdiction under this submission does not concern uh, jurisdiction rights on the materia, 
Therefore, the court may not be absolutely categorical in this statement. But it also concerns the judicial integrity of whole international dispute settlement system. Because let us provide the example that since 1995, when WTO was established, state members of WTO demonstrated clear tendency bringing 600, more than 600 disputes before WTO and non-trade related before this court, apart from Islamic Republic of Iran, who is not a member of WTO and brought two trade related matters before this court. Therefore, we submit that in view of proliferation of international bodies, it is essential that this court preserves judicial integrity and sound administration of justice. So if you uh, are so positive about sending rulings to other courts, should we send the ruling about the uh, arrest warrant to the ICC? Not exactly, Mr. President, because <laughs> the questions before the ICC, that, uh, the, the point elaborated by the applicant, and we part, partially agree with it, because ICC will deal with the no notions of individual criminal responsibility, which was clearly distinguished by this honorable court in post and genocide judgment 2006. While the issues of immunities is the issue of general international law, therefore this court shall adjudicate this issue. That's your excellencies, but if the court disagrees with us on this matter and states that it possesses valid well title of jurisdiction, we submit that alternatively at our state is inadmissible by virtue of principle of these standards. This doctrine, which bars parallel proceedings of equal character, uh, was the, uh, concern, considered by this court in our so Your counterpart gave us uh, the three identities rule. Do you disagree with that rule? Your Excellency, we agree with general points, but what we do disagree with is the interpretation provided by the applicant. And we submit that, though Adar uh, Rasasa concedes that two claims pursued, are pursued by the, uh, identical parties, but subject matters of them are also similar. The applicant stated that what is essential is that two claims arise from, different, uh, from the same rule of law. But we submit that it is essential that they arise from the obligations which are identical in their scope. Is Liz Pendens a rule of customary international law or a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations? What, what is its status under Article 38 of the statute of the ICJ? Mr. President, the position of the respondent is that nowadays Liz Pendens amounts to general principle of law under Article 31, 38, Clause 1, Clause D of the ICJ statute. Given the widespread adoption in domestic procedural codes, as well as international human rights treaties, investment and trade related matters. Thus, Your Excellency, proceeding back to the subject matters, we submit that both Article 3 of CHT Treaty and respective tariff schedules under Article 2 of General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade provide identical scope of protection for Hellen products, namely, eliminating any customs duties on them. Therefore, in fact, two claims in different bodies arise from the obligations which are identical in their scope. Thus, the subject matter requirement is satisfied. The applicant also claimed that two uh, before two bodies, at our claims, different forms of reparations. However, Your Excellencies, we rely on the jurisprudence of the Order Justice of the European Union in that case, where it stated that the object concerns the general results sought by the claim, but not particular reparations. We submit that general results uh, in two bodies are identical because in both of them, at our sixth, the withdrawal of tariffs. Therefore, and it is our alternative argument that by doing this and by maximizing the chances of winning and creating a double relief, Adama may have used judicial process as stated by this court. Can we talk don't. about the essential security interest claim? Um, you know, in the United States, the President Donald Trump claims that essential security interests are necessary to separate uh, parents and their children at the border to, uh, to build a wall um, that block people from coming in to impose uh, tariffs on China. Uh, where does the essential security interest argument end? Do you think that those are illegal uh, applications of essential security interests or do they follow from your position? Mr. President, yeah, we, yes, we will now move directly to the substance of our claim. And we uh, disagree with the applicant on the standard applicable for uh, determining essential security interests. The applicant relied on the jurisprudence of exit tribunals in Argentinian cases. But actually, your respectful colleagues, Justice Crawford and Justice Gaia, were, were the ones who reviewed the, uh, judgment, the decision of exit tribunal in CMS case. And they stated that exit tribunal committed the error of law by mixing two standards the customary one under Article 25 of Articles of State Responsibility, and the treaty ones prescribed by bilateral investment treaty. Thus, we submit that the applicant may not rely solely upon the exit test. But we will propose that the court another test established by issue of own jurisprudence 
in military and paramilitary activities in the domestic robbery judgment in 1986. In, in, in that case, what was the uh, standard or what was the uh, treaty under which the, the, the court reviewed? For example, uh, the court reviewed French commerce and navigation treaty between U.S. and Nicaragua, and the, ident the treaty clause in that uh, particular agreement was identical to Article 22B of CHC treaty. The court outlined three obligatory criteria for its adjudication, namely the presence of reasonable risk to the state's interest, necessity, and proportionality of the measure. We will now demonstrate step by step that all these criteria are met, but also, moving to the question of Mr. President, we submit that the notion of essential security interest may not cover, as uh, what was stated by drafters of General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, everything in the world and everything under the sun. But it covers only the quintessential matters of the state existence. And in the modern state of the world in inter international relations, it is impossible to deny that the economy of the state is the basis for the state's existence. We submit that Osasa's economy, contrary to the applicant's allegations, was threatened by such risks. Because firstly, three factors shall be viewed cumulatively. Firstly, in 2012, Hurricane McCann unprecedentedly struck the whole region and devastated 60% of Hellen industry in Rasaza, which is even incomparable to other states, where I've achieved... Well, well, when, when was the time, when, when was the year when Hurricane struck? 2012, Your Excellency. And when, when we are, do, what is the year that we are here? 2013, Your Excellency. So, for, for all these years, uh, was you, you argue that your essential interests were affected and you haven't done much and now you raise this claim? Your Excellency, not exactly, because what shall be viewed is all factors uh, cumulatively and steadily. We submit that indeed hurricane itself may have not amounted to the threat to essential interest, mm -hmm. but it devastated 60% of Rosada's Sahara industry. Mm -hmm. Then during the next four years, Severe atrocity de devastated more percentage, and the effects of the company is silent on this particular significance. But moreover, Adalas farmers became disproportionate, disproportionate investment in the Rosada strategic sector since 2016. And as stated in paragraph 1 of the company, it takes Helen Hyacinth no less than 20 years to renovate after the hurricane. Therefore, in the following years, the crisis will only be uh, more trade. And this was uh, the reason for Rosada to introduce tariffs nowadays. But your argument reminds me of the Russian argument in the traffic and transit case, which is a WTO panel decision that never went to the appellate body. So this is your favorite kind of case. Uh, they say uh, a member would need to articulate his essential security interest with greater specificity than in an emergency. In other words, very high specificity. And you're just talking about a general threat to the economy. That seems uh, much, much more vague than the test of the WTO panel. Set out. Mr. President, we will explain the difference. Because uh, when uh, establishing the test in Russia traffic and transit, WTO panel directly adjudicated Article 21 of General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which in fact is as though it is self judging in nature, but it prescribes three exceptional situations when emergency clause may be played. And among them, there is such an exception as emergency in international relations. Therefore, the WTO panel should have reviewed whether Russia's measures at least uh, relate to this emergency in international relations. In contrast, Article 22B of CHC Treaty does not give such an exhaustive list. Therefore, each threat which significantly uh, influences the South's economy would be enough to demonstrate the presence of reasonable risk. So what's the controlling law, uh, the CHC or the Mr. President, uh, under this uh, submission, we apply solely the standard of this court under the uh, in Nicaragua case for CHC treaty, and we rely on the uh, jurisprudence of WTO panel only in cases if it does not contradict the court jurisprudence, namely for, for instance, if it is necessary to determine what is essential security, security interest. Thus, Rex, as briefly describing our last argument on proportionality of the measure, we submit that Rasasa did not possess other alternatives <coughs> to safeguard its interest. Because the applicant gave the alternative to benefit from Rasaza's strong robotics sector, but paragraph 9 of the company states that Rasaza is a strong participant of that sector. But nothing in that uh, statement of a big tax demonstrates that Rasaza benefits from receiving uh, and receives money from this particular sphere. Therefore, as the facts uh, of the case are silent, no assumption may be made on this particular point. That's the excellencies. I see the question, Mr. President. Thus, we submit that no reasonable alternative was open to the state of Rasaza, and the measure appeared necessary and proportionate. Thus, it was justified by Article 22B of CHC Treaty. 
if I may, just one small question. Would you um, the, go back to the these courts? Um, revision of the or the, the um, uh, consideration of the same article or the, the article which is actually the, the, the same in, in, in its wording in the in the Nicaragua case and here how the facts of this case um, are applicable because you use the judgment and you use the um, the discussion of these courts in that case how you could apply those circumstances to the circumstances at hand in absence of the, of the use of force. Your Excellency, uh, apart from uh, descri describe, uh, adjudicating on military and paramilitary activities, the court go went further in that particular case and, uh, and reviewed whether economic, uh, uh, economic measures of the United States, namely trade embargo and uh, sugar cut, for example, uh, cut of sugar quotas, amounted to the breach of friendship, commerce, and navigation treaty. Therefore, the facts are not totally comparable, but still there was the economically related issues. And we submit that the criteria described by the court were general for the, for the clauses of such a nature. Therefore, the facts shall not be totally identical, but the criteria may be applicable upon this context. Is the CHC treaty a friendship, commerce, and navigation treaty? Not exactly, Mr. President, but we submit that in friendship, commerce, and navigation treaty, they are not enshrined in trade related matters, uh, which may be comparable to the one no customs duty obligation on the CHC treaty. And maybe you can explain why your minister shouldn't be arrested. Indeed, Mr. President. Uh, on this, uh, before we go into that matter, we would like to emphasize that uh, Rosada is not a party to the Rome Statute, which is crucial for the present submission. So on this last issue, uh, she's in custody. Uh, she's going to appear before the ICC. She'll make this objection. Why don't we just let them decide? <coughs> um, if we rule, they could rule differently from us. Um, so why don't we just let them take the first crack? It's, it's their statute, the wrong statute. So well, why should we pass on this issue? Just find it in this Because when drafting uh, their own statute, the state parties uh, let the states uh, their space for determination under Article 98 of the own statute, stating that there is a possibility of conflict of obligations between customary rules of international law and the rules under the own statute. Therefore, we submit that this court is primarily entitled to interpret the first part, namely the customary rule on impunities. And we submit that in the present case, this judgment is crucial because it is a question of due procedure before the International Criminal Court. The applicant indeed relied on the case law of the ICC, dating back to uh, before Jordan Hill, but that case law is inapplicable by the following reasons. Firstly, it concerned a different situation when there, uh, when there was, as stated by this court, a Security Council resolution. We may agree that Security Council resolution w uh, was necessary in order to establish the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. But what it also did, it, uh, it de facto made the state of Sudan the party to the wrong statute because it obliged it to f him, uh, the, excuse me, the state of Sudan to fully cooperate with the International Court. What if we find that uh, Bashir is a sitting head of state and uh, Minister Gray is not, so we, we, don't, we don't care about the Sudan case? Mr. President, under the, the rule of customary international law, communities of the, the charges that your foreign minister is a war criminal, and uh, the Rome Statute arose precisely because ministers of different states were war criminals. So, is it contrary to the object and purpose of the Rome Statute to give this uh, person um, the kind of immunity you're suggesting? Not exactly, Mr. President, because the first notion is that even the allegations of war crimes or crimes against humanity do not themselves lead the immunities of ministers of foreign affairs. With regard to so ministers of foreign affairs can design killer machines and get away with it. That's your position. No, Mr. President, respectfully not. We submit that ministers of foreign affairs are entitled to be brought to, internet, to individual criminal liability, but only in cases when due procedure is met by international criminal court itself. And with regard to the question of object and purpose of the Rome Statute, we submit that the situation with the Rome Statute is different from what the one which appeared, for, for example, in International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia or for Rwanda, due to the fact that they were created themselves by Security Council resolution. ICC in its turn, in the beginning of the thousands, was designed as a universal body, but as a treaty-based one, namely that the state shall expressly give their consent for the proper procedure of the International Criminal Court. And this is also uh, undertaken by paragraph 61 of the RS foreign judgment upon which the applicant relied on. Because the particular wording is that the, the minister may be subject to international criminal jurisdiction. 
The phrase maybe indicates that only in cases if the due procedure is met before the ICC, but not a priori. Therefore, we submit that the applicant state was obliged by virtue of Article 97 of the Roman Statute when there was the allegation of conflict of obligations to at least to consult with the International Criminal Court on the matter. The next answer is but we have the second argument with regard to the uh, customer nature of exception to misgrace of unities. We submit that the exception provided by this court in rest warrant judgment in paragraph 61 shall be on the red in conjunction with the passage of paragraph 58 of the rest warrant where the court clearly stated that in due, uh, the uh, exceptions applicable before international criminal tribunal may not be likewise applicable before national tribunal. And the only case contradicting this position was the judgment of uh, ICC in Jordan Hill case. It was the first case when ICC directly stated that the uh, customer exception extends not only to relation vis-a-vis -vis the court itself, but also for the purposes of cooperation of state parties with the court. Before that particular point of time, there is no indication that state practice and opinion jurists are manifest and widespread enough to demonstrate that such a, an exception may be applicable so widely. Thus, we submit that, um, this, uh, that uh, such an exception does not share widespread and constant state practice and opinion jurists, which also may be supported by the practice of status of African Union, who refuse to... These are great arguments, so why shouldn't they be made first to the ICC? Because the ICC could determine what are the responsibilities of state parties and non-state parties and in cases that are referred by a party versus the cases referred by the Security Council. This is this is very technical for a, a court, it's a generalist court like us. Mr. President, we submit that there is no possibility for make such a determination because Rosaza is not a party to their own study, and the African state believe that they comply with uh, all necessary international obligations. As I said at the beginning, it's very easy. We just let her go and make this argument at the Hague. She's going to go there, so why don't you just make that argument as a way of defense? Mr. President, because this case is fundamental not only with regard to ICC's procedure, but also for stability of treaty relations, and namely for, for the necessary application of Article 34 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which clearly stipulates that no treaty obligation may be imposed upon the state which is not a party to the treaty. And also, it concerns the fundamental question of the state's sovereignty, which is a, ne which is a necessary precondition for ministries of foreign affairs uh, appropriate uh, function. Thus, for Excellencies, to conclude our arguments in the fourth submission, we uh, ask this court to a judgment to clear that arrest and detention of ministry of the trade amounted to the international law. Aren't there many treaties that have uh, implications for third parties who are not parties to the treaty? Uh, Mr. President, there are, there are such treaties, for instance, when they establish the, uh, according to Article 36 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, when they establish the right for the third state and the state does not object. But with regard to obligation, it may only be so, according to uh, works of highly qualified policies, if, the, if, if it is not the obligation, but incidentally a favorable effect. But in the present case, it was an indirect obligation to depart to waive these various immunities, which is contrary to the notion of Article 34 BCLT. So can I understand the totality of your position is that um, you have uh, set up a killer, set up uh, automated killer machine. Uh, the person who did it is arrested but should be released. You impose 25% tariffs just to protect your economy. And uh, our view is, your view is we should just let you go. Mr. President, you did nothing wrong. Your, your position is you did nothing wrong. May I answer this question, Mr. President? Yeah, it's a big question. You did nothing wrong. We submit with regard to all these claims that firstly, no international wrongful act indeed took place, and secondly, if it did, it may be justified by virtue of either of customary international laws or treaty-based necessity. Thank you for your kind attention. This concludes the respondent's submission. I may please vote. Mr. President, the accent is two points in rebuttal. Firstly, the respondent stated that Adala must only succeed to the international zone of peace and only to one provision of the Treaty of Bodega and not to the treaty as a whole. However, Yaxman says, in the, as the Council of League of Nations with regard to, with regard to Island Island Convention established, 
which established neutralization, stated that it is especially important to succeed to the treaty as a whole if such treaty establishes peace. And in the present case, Your Excellencies, this is exactly the case because the Treaty of Bottega was aimed at saving the succeeding generations from the scourge of war and exactly to prevent such situation as in the present case before this honorable So, uh, Council, let me just explain our uh, puzzlement. Uh, we're happy to uh, adjudicate on the merits of the autonomous system. We, we just don't want to make a ruling that's too broad and affects too many things. Uh, how, how would you suggest we proceed? Could you clarify a question, please? We want to find jurisdiction, and we want to pass on the lawfulness of the system, but we don't want to pass on the lawfulness of all autonomous weapons systems. In so what's the best way to proceed? Mr. President, this way the applicant would suggest that it should that the court should analyze the nature of the wall in the present case, which is incapable, in fact, which is aimed at killing as a last resort and using lethal force against anyone forcing the border in other, in other direction. And we would suggest that the court could only allow the semi-autonomous weapon when the life of and death decisions are made by human and not by the artificial intelligence. And it is especially important in the present case not to <coughs> allow such fully autonomous weapon which is independent of human control to make life and death decisions, Your Excellencies. And due to the lack of time, Your Excellencies, this concludes my But isn't it your position that uh, Dorian Gray is the human control? No, I see my time is up. Well, I mean, if, if, if she has no responsibility, then why is she under arrest? Mr. President, to clarify, Darren Gray is not, had, had, there is no indication that Darren Gray, in fact, commanded over the decisions made by the war. This is because the decisions are made on the basis of the program, not on the basis of the common responsibility. And moreover, Darren Gray is charged by the International Criminal Court for committing war crimes in another state party. And to prevent the future war crimes, the Excellencies respectfully ask the court to declare that Darren Gray must be surrendered. And this concludes my rebuttal. May it please the court. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, the respondent has two points for the summary battle. First of all, with regard to the Albert Adams incident, it was directly stated in the decision, and I quote, that the treaty is binding on whichever state found itself in possession of the Article 11, end of quote. Therefore, the rule there was directly linked to the territory itself. Consequently, the treaty primarily established the territorial obligations, and contrary to the applicant's contentions, it was not subject to the succession due to the uh, issues of peace which were raised by the treaty. However, because of its purely territorial regime, which was established by this legal agreement. Moreover, the adoptions of clause recognizes ipso jure jurisdiction of the court, uh, evidence of the high degree of confidence existing um, uh, between the parties, and do not survive state succession ordinarily. Consequently, respondent submits that Article 6 under the main Maybe you can answer the question I asked your counterpart, which is uh, we are inclined to, or I personally am inclined to figure out a way to get jurisdiction because I want to rule on this at the time as well. <coughs> What, what should be the scope of the ruling on autonomous weapons? What should be the scope of the ruling with regard to autonomous weapons? Uh, they want one that says anytime human judgment is not involved, it's illegal per se. Mr. President, the respondent says that uh, machines are unimaginably more reliable than human soldiers and therefore human interference would only violate the principles of distinction. And the example can be found in the U.S. Navy cruiser attack on the Iranian civilian uh, plane where the uh, radars detected this plane as being a civilian one. However, people feeling uh, uh, fear that this plane might be uh, occupied by the terrorists. The so book, this plane. The book Tell Our Missile that shot down MH17 over eastern Ukraine was uh, totally automated. So you, you want us to say that, that was a lawful weapon? Mr. President, not exactly. That machine was automatic. We were not autonomous itself. Automatic machines, pardon me, my Yes, please. Uh, automatic machines 
uh, act in accordance with the one program which is already filled in the system, where they are unable to assess their circumstances. On the contrary, autonomous machines have such a possibility and consequently <coughs> their decisions are distinctive and proportionate. This concludes the respondent's sorry about it and my question. Honourable Court is now adjourned. Council and spectators will please clear the courtroom to allow the judges to deliver.